All right, welcome back to Think Tech, talking tax with Tom on a Wednesday. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Hi, Jay. That's Tom Yamachiki, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. They watch our taxes, but in so doing, they watch fiscal policy too. Right. Okay, it's all about taxing and spending, and it's got to be in balance. Matter of fact, the Constitution, at least theoretically, the state Constitution, at least theoretically, requires that. Yeah, it doesn't say so explicitly, but, but there's been a of a gloss on it that you know, certain words can say you need to have a balanced budget right and, and that and that you know has been i think one of the problems uh that uh in at least last year when i when i wrote about the situation um we had a state financial plan i don't know if you're familiar with it but we have a state financial plan and the state financial plan uh pegged us for spending in excess of what we were receiving for three or four years in a row like Two hundred million dollars in the red every year. Mm, wow! So, uh, 2019, 200 million. 2020, 260 million. 2021, another 200 million. 2022, they go back to 100, 100 million. Only 100 million. <laughs> Be thankful for the small things. <laughs> that's correct. Yes. Now that's not really acceptable because we're not that healthy anyway. We have a, a huge. Um, number for unliquidated liabilities uh, and going, I remember we had a program, think I got a program in Fuller Hall in, uh, in the Women's Y a few years ago where we explored, you know, exactly how stable, you know, the state. And, and um, you know, uh, a lot of our experts felt that the, uh, you know, that the ultimate unpaid liability here was going to be huge. I mean, soon, like $40 billion, we'd have to belly up somehow and cover that. Um, and that includes the cost of repatriating the homeless. It includes the cost of handling certain issues which we promised to handle. And I don't think, I don't think actually it included the cost of dealing with extreme weather, which could be devastating and which could require, you know, a lot of money. And we can't be sure that it's going to come from Washington. Look how, you know, most recently uh, federal government, that is Donald Trump, uh, stopped funding for Puerto Rico even though Puerto Rico is in terrible, terrible shape. Um, and it has never recovered from, from uh, Maria. So uh, we, can't, we can't assume that somebody's gonna write a big check, somebody's gonna come and do FEMA with us, uh, somebody's gonna rebuild our society after extreme weather. And you know, chances are one of these days, maybe even this summer, we, we could have extreme weather. So you have all these unfunded liabilities and no cushion. This is a big problem, don't you think? Oh, of course. Um... You know, I've, I've kind of been looking at, this, at the situation and I kind of, um, you know, pigeonholed our, our big problems into the three Ps. Okay. One of the three Ps is pension. Uh, and and what, I, what I mean by that is uh, we have made these big promises to our state workers, not, not only to give them pension, but also to cover their health care. Uh, in some cases for as long as they live. Huge. And that was one of the elements of that 40 billion, by the way. Well, I'm, I'm sure it was. Uh, we also, you know, just to be you know, doubly sure, uh, we passed a constitutional amendment, uh, I think it was back in the, back in the 70s or so, uh, saying that uh, these benefits to our state workers will not be diminished, period, come hell or high water. Um, and the only way we, we can change that is through another constitutional amendment. Lots of luck. An HGEA would oppose the second constitutional amendment. Well, of course it would, uh, as well as probably every other you know, organized labor um, organization in the state. Now, but what that highlights is that we have uh, this obligation for what we have promised to our workers after their employment ends. Okay. we have this constitutional provision that locks it in place. So even if we make changes now, they, they, they would only apply to new hires. Uh, and it would not have any appreciable financial effect for, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Well, I mean, you know, this has been expanding as a problem for a long time. I mean, we, we, you know, it's not like there's any rule out there that says you can only hire X number of state employees. Remember, remember the thing, uh, oh God, uh, I remember so well, the big argument a few years ago, how many state employees did we have? 
Nobody could answer it. Um, and there's no rule. There's no rule about what percentage of the labor force should be working for the state or the city. Yeah, uh, and, 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 and that, that points up another big problem. And, 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 uh, and one of the big, big problems has been, you know, who knows how much money the state has? There are a lot of people who don't know, and the reason, be, the reason is because the money isn't in one place. It's in, it's in special funds as well as in the general accounts. Um, the methods for dealing with and or, and or accounting for special funds are varied and uh, you know, sometimes not consistent. Sometimes the departments fail to report them like they're supposed to. Well, they're, holding, they're holding a little something themselves, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's not just an error, not an oversight. They just, they just want to hold little rainy day money for themselves. Isn't that true? That's what it seems like. I mean, you, you never know what the, the actual motivations are. But, um, so, you know, one question is, how much money does the state really have? Yeah. You know, after, after you answer that question, then, then maybe you can kind of get to, well, are, are we spending it properly or are we, are we spending too much? Well, and is it accessible, you know, for the state in general, if it's essentially hidden? Linda Lingle, we talked about this last show. Linda Lingle had an initiative to try to find it. I don't think she ever found it, uh, maybe some of it, but there's a lot of money out there where if, you, if you're the governor and you say, gee, we need to dig deep, we need to get the special fund money, we need all of it now for a special emergency, okay, it's not clear what would happen, not clear that we'd have access to it. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm not even sure the, uh, that the executive departments would cooperate yeah. because, because, you know, as you, as you know, uh, there are elected officials, right, who are at the titular head of of government. They issue orders to these departments. Uh, the departments have a lot of civil service people. And a lot of them have the mentality of, oh, well, uh, you're here now, I'm here now. Uh, in four years, you will be gone. And, and I'll, I'll still be, be here. here. I've seen that. I've seen that personally. And it's extraordinary. You know, it's like, I'm comfortable. doesn't matter what you do, I can outlast you. So I'm not going to listen. Right. So. Uh, so that, that's the first P, um, pensions, and around that it, it, it are, are some you know, very, very serious issues about, you know, kind of counting what we have and where we have it. Yeah. So this, you know, this, this is a problem because, uh, and I'll just take the one thing that troubles me most. Sure. Uh, although the, um, you know, pleasure time system troubles me greatly. I mean, we owe, how much was it? It was billions. It was several billion dollars in arrears on paying the required contributions into the employee's retirement system. Well, and, that's, and that's not even as big as the, the EUTF, the Employer, Employer Union Trust Fund. That's the uh, plan that That's different, right. Healthcare. That's another one, right. It's bigger. Yeah. So when you start adding this up, it's, it's a huge emergency. amount of money. Yeah. I, mean, wait, let's, I guess let's focus on that just for a minute. Sure. So if, if I'm in the union, if I'm a state employee or retired state employee, and, and I realize this is going to affect the ability of the state and those funds to pay my retirement, to take care of my medical, what have you, um, which was promised to me. And I've worked all these years in reliance on that promise. And it's not going to be there. We're, we're coming to that. I really think we're coming to that. What do I do? Who do I, who do I go to? Who do I sue? What do I say? How do I, how do I get the, the government to correct this? How do I get to correct this? What do I do? Well, I think your best bet is to do nothing because <laughs> uh, a lot of people think, you know, this is like a problem with, you know, if, if, the, if the government's not going to pay me, you know, I'm entitled to the money. I'm, I'm going to sue for it. I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever it is. Uh, but, you know, the, the fact that the government may not have enough money in the present it's not my problem, okay? You gotta pay me. Constitution says that. You gotta pay me. If, if you got other problems, you know, it's not my cooling. I'm the priority, constitutionally. Yeah. I'm the priority. Which is, you know, that's nice if there is enough money somehow available. Okay, now, now go to the thing I worry about most, and I worry about extreme weather. I worry about the Puerto Rico scenario. Um, I worry about the possibility of the island, this island, you know, the center of the state, the headquarters of the state, the business center of the state will be wrecked in a storm. Um, and, you know, we won't have the center anymore. Our, our, our buildings, our infrastructure, uh, all of the things that connect everything up will be gone. 
or damage to the point where we can't fix it. And we'd be far away from any help. That's what I worry about too. I mean, for example, if some critical piece of equipment goes in our infrastructure and it was made in Germany, how are we going to get it here? How are we going to install it? How long will that take? Um, you know, this is pretty serious. How much will it cost? Who's going to pay uh, when there's no revenue, when tourism stops cold, right? Right. We, we could be in such dire straits to make Puerto Rico look great. So, you know, when that happens, where do we dig? Do we have a special fund for that? Do we have a little rainy day money for that? Where do I get, where does the state get the money to well, we, handle we, the, we, in theory, have a rainy day fund. What? What is it? Uh, that's what it's called, a rainy day fund. It's, it's... <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm, I'm just kind of get, getting educated here. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, deposits are made to it every time we have excess, excess money. Um, the Constitution requires that uh, if we have, you know, fund balance surplus in, I think, two years in a row uh, of a certain percentage, then we either have to feed um, uh, unfunded liabilities, or we have to make a deposit in the rainy day fund, we issue refunds to the taxpayer. Okay. Um, in this past session, we passed a bill to do the second of the three, and that is to make a contribution in, into the rainy day fund. I think it was, you know, I don't know, $5 million. Peanuts. Yeah. I mean, it would cost billions to fix Humpty. That's right. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> where do we get the bit? Does the rainy day fund have billions? No, but Uncle Sam does. I mean, I think that's well, the theory. You're making a big assumption that yeah. FEMA will come through that President Trump, who may not like Hawaii very much, it's a democratic stronghold. But it's still a state. I think that's, that's the one thing we have over Puerto Rico. They're out of state and we are. That's comforting, Tom. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope that I, I hope that's something we don't have to rely on, but we can rely on that. So, you know, in terms of the, the Council on Revenues, that whole mechanism that tells us what the budget should be, um, does that build in rainy day, rainy day fund too? In other words, they say, well, Council on Revenue thinks that we're going to get this much in tax receipts this year. Um, and so uh, we, should, we should actually spend X dollars less Y dollars and put Y dollars in the rainy day fund. Well, they don't do that. I mean, uh, I guess. What, what, what COR does is, is estimates the revenue that's coming in. I mean, that's pretty much all they do. What, all they do. what they do with it is the legislature's to rely on. Okay. And, and you know, to, to a lesser extent, the governor's because, uh, you know, he needs to sign off on the budget bill. Well, it you know, strikes me that uh, I'm, I'm casting about for a mechanism that would protect us, um, that would handle these 40, 40 billion plus, plus, plus coming up. What did I hear on the radio yesterday that per capita, we have the highest number of homeless in the country? Per capita, pretty serious. I mean, who's to say who they are, where they came from, what their life is like, what the government can do, is doing, should do, you know, to support them and repatriate them. Um, but it seems to me that the numbers are increasing. And over time, it's a threat to our society, the stability of our society, not only in Oahu, but all the islands. Well, I guess the, we, the, uh, the blessing and the curse that we have is it's, it's uh you know, warm and habitable all year round. Right. Uh, if you're homeless and in New York City, uh, and, it's, and it's, it's the winter time, you may not survive the winter. Yeah. And that's, that's how we get rid of a lot of the homeless, I yeah, guess. Come out here, enjoy a little sun. I, I've not talked to homeless people. They really like it here. This is a good, really, really good place. So, you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm wondering, um, you know, what the, where there's this tipping point on the homeless. I mean, right, right now we kick the can down the road. And, and we make political statements and speeches, and we have iconic projects that it really are not calculated to handle it. Um, you know, they say that 15,000 homeless, it's probably more. Um, and a lot of it is, is not in the hands of government. It's in the hands of private nonprofits, and um, that may not be enough. And, uh, you know, if you, you give money, well, that's, that's an optional thing. Um, we need a, a system. And, and the question is, if we don't have a system and we reach a tipping point, Call it a societal stability tipping point, where instead of 15,000 or 20,000, whatever it is, now we have 30,000 or 40,000 or 100,000. This really undermines, you know, uh, law and order and stability and the economy if we have this. Furthermore, we're a tourist economy. Our, our 
by far our most important industry is tourism. Well, having a homeless guy or woman on the steps of your hotel, you know, I remember going to Manila one time, that's yeah. what they had on the yeah, steps of the hotel. It's not good for business. It's not good for business. And, yeah. and it would diminish the tourist business and the brand, you know, over the long term. So it becomes really critical for us. It is really critical for us to handle the homeless right here, right now. We're not doing it. Yeah, so so that, that's, a, that's another one of the four P's, protect the brand. Right? Yeah, yeah. We, ha we, we have uh, assets here in Hawaii um, that, that give us our, our income. We have you know, these institutions and these uh, natural features that uh, constitute our economy that, that, that get our engine running. And that's what we've got to protect. Yeah. And, and we have to build industries. That's another show. It's, a, you know, like we could talk about uh, technology. We could talk about astronomy. We're not going to talk about that today. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about two more Ps, though. Right? Okay, go ahead. And then, and then um, you've, got, you've got a well, break coming up, right? Yeah, let's talk about a B instead of a P. Well, let's, let's take a B uh -huh. and have a break. And when we come back from the break, we'll talk about the two remaining Ps. All right. I'm Yamachika, president of the Hawaii Tax Foundation. We are so happy to be able to talk to him and find the answers to these difficult questions. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Keisha King, host of At the Crossroads, where we have conversations that are real and relevant. We have spoken with community leaders from right here locally in Hawaii and all around the world. Won't you join us on thinktechhawaii.com or on YouTube on the Think Tech Hawaii channel. Our conversations are real, relevant, and lots of fun. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, achieving and sustaining success, and finding greatness. If you're a student, parent, sports or business person, and want to improve your life and the lives of people around you, tune in and join me on Mondays at 11 a.m. as we go Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. We're back with Tom Yamachika, president of the Hawaii Tax Foundation, here on Talking Tax with Tom. And um, uh, we have two more Ps to cover. This is very important in our discussion of fiscal responsibility. Uh, so one is procurement. What's that about? Okay, procurement is the process by which the, our government goes out and, and buys goods and services that it needs. So it can't do everything itself. Its, its employees can only do so much. Uh, you, you still got to buy things, right? That, that, that we don't produce ourselves, uh, or services uh, that we you know, don't have the expertise for. So uh, there, there have been complaints over the years that you know, we're paying too much for stuff. And if we can figure out a way to pay like, real actual market rates for things, or, or less, given the state purchasing power that we have, mm. or, and, or could you know, potentially tap into, uh, then we'll be paying a lot less for uh, the stuff that we need today, and, and we could save up more for tomorrow. Yeah, on the other side of that, though, is this issue about corruption and about bringing in your, um, you know, your cousin's aunt's uncle to do the job um, and, um, you know, uh, violating any, any sense of um, propriety and, for that matter, law. So we have the procurement code, um, and I have personal well, experience with that, too. Yeah. The procurement code is the most bureaucratic thing you ever saw, and it holds the stuff up. And it does not actually result in the lowest price, although technically that may be so. Um, and it takes forever to get things. So the result is that the state <clears throat> and agency cannot actually get it right away. It has to go through this process, which everybody sort of accepts. And it's sort of the Zen acceptance of the, of the delays and complications of the procurement code. I don't think it's efficient at all. Yeah, the, the Department of Education kind of found one way to, to, to get through at least part of it um, by something called job order contracting. That's something that they uh, recently publicized. I, I wrote about it earlier this year. And 
uh, it's it's basically a means of saying, well, okay, uh, well, uh, uh, we, the Department of Education, are, are going to be looking for certain goods on this menu. So contractors bid on uh, the, uh, the individual items in the menu, although it's not needed at the current, you know, at the, at the present time. And then when people do need it, they can kind of order off the menu. And, uh, you know, since all of the negotiation and uh, bidding and, 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 and award and that kind of thing has been done before, or it has, it, it's been done already, and it's in place, all they do is just pay the money and get their stuff. Does it work? Uh, according to DOE, it does. They've, they've recorded some uh, very impressive uh, gains with uh, uh, you know, cooling the classrooms, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cause I, I sat on the neighborhood board for a while, and the and DOE would uh, come to us and say, can you guys, uh, you know, ante up a few bucks from your pocket, from your wallet right now, because we have to buy pencils for the school. Oh, my God. You know, the state has a billion-dollar budget on, on education. They can't afford pencils? Are you kidding me? Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's, th it's that kind of inefficiency. And that's a light word for it. But I, I'm hoping we're on a, on a track anyway, but that, that will be better off coming soon. Yeah, another you know a thing that you know seems to be in the way is is uh, there's there's a lot of silo mentality, um, you know, around procurement and and around spending. Uh, recently, uh, this nonprofit called Education Institute of Hawaii was in the news because they tried to get G the DOE's general ledger, and was you know publicly rebuked by um, uh, the uh, you know uh, Superintendent Kishimoto. Uh, so they filed suit, and, and that was like earlier this month, uh, last month, last month, this is August already, so it was in July. And, uh, you know, it's still pending in the court system, but, you know, we may get something uh, very interesting out of that. You know, this goes to leadership, you know, just as the question of how many employees are working for the state and the counties, and, um, you know, uh, what percentage of the total population is represented there, and, are there too many of them? I, you know, I think the answer is clear. There are too many of them because they hire and hire. If, if the budget for one year will, will afford the hire, then that's a permanent addition to the workforce. And you can't get rid of them or their benefits. Really amazing. Um, but but, but you know, the leadership should be looking at that. Is the leadership looking at that? Is the leadership looking at the procurement code? Is the leadership looking at trying to balance this and develop, developing a uh, you know, resilient fiscal policy for the future? Not that I'm aware of. Maybe they are, but, but they haven't told people about that. Mm. I mean, and, you know, if, if they're coming up with a financial plan that's you know, $200 million in the, in the red every year, I mean, you, you wouldn't think so. No, I guess not. What's the last P, Tom? Last P is permitting. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's kind of a, a big cog in our economy, and this is it's kind of more uh, at, the, um, at the county level. Uh, you, you have people who you know, want to build on land. You, want to people, you, you have people who want to improve uh, buildings and structures and so forth, and they have to go through this process called permitting. And, and it holds up and it affects you know, many, many different industries, many, many different people. Uh, Sometimes and for years and decades. Yeah, and it's legendary in that respect. I remember Castle and Cook talked about its first project out in Mililani somewhere, a housing project, and they needed to get... I guess county and state approval to do this. And it said from the time they conceived the project till the time they got the permits was 40 years, 40 years. Okay, I, I don't think this is that, that bad for every project, but that's an example of how outrageously long it can take to get permits in the state. Yeah, and, and it's not only just the, 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 the state or the city, but also you know, there are different um, uh, you know, sub-agencies and commissions and you know, like the Historic Preservation Committee, there's a coastal Coastal Land Management Board, there's uh, uh, all kinds of things that get uh, uh, implicated once you do a, a, pr a project in a certain location or that's, that does a certain thing. Um, you know, I mean, come on, why don't we just consolidate all this stuff? Uh, you know, give you know, the plans the, 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 the review they need. Uh, if we need to go through a separate process like a environmental impact statement, you know, have one agency that can that can help with that, uh, but you know, going through like you know billions and billions of different sub iterations 
uh, and then if one thing goes wrong in, in one of them going back to the beginning and having to go through everybody again, that's, that's just ridiculous. Well, you know, if you have too many um, employees, they all got to do something. And if there are a lot of people on the permitting gauntlet, so to say, and they all have to be occupied uh, to earn their salary, then they're all going to be uh, a stopping point. You know, I remember at uh, one point, many points, I, I had to take a flight for the state of Hawaii. And uh, they said, you know, you're going to get reimbursed for your parking at the airport. I think that's great. So, I, you know, I spent seven, eight dollars for my parking at the, at the airport. I put a chin in <clears throat> to get reimbursed for it. It would take six months for me to get a check. And it, that shit passed through the hands of dozens of people before it got approved and paid and the check sent to me in the mail. I said to myself, gee, I wonder how much money they're spending on, on reimbursing me for the parking, which was 7 or $8. Did you know, for example, that, um, uh, that you know, when you get a tax refund, it isn't the Department of Taxation that cuts the check. The, the Department of Taxation takes in your money, right? But it can't issue checks. It has to go to the Department of Accounting and General Services to issue their checks for them. Now, uh, I, 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 can, I can see um, that being, you know, they're, they're doing that initially to try to consolidate uh, disbursements uh, and, and make that process more efficient, but, you know, sometimes it just, just, uh, which is the point of idiocy. Well, I, nobody will argue that the state is not efficient. I mean, Neil Abercrombie was trying to upgrade the computer system. And uh, he hired a guy um, from GSA, brought him out here. Um, I can't remember the name right now. He spent a lot of money, including private-public partnership money, to examine whether the state um, you know, needed to have an upgrade on its computer system. Because it was a piece on this on NPR, or rather HPR, a few days ago. The fact is, they got lots of disparate systems. They don't talk to each other. It would be okay to have one department, you know, identify what the refund is and another cut the check as long as they were integrated on the computer system. But they're not. You know, I remember uh, Andrew uh, Aoki one time got in front of uh, our uh, Venture Capital Association, and uh, it was really funny. He said, um, you know, um, we, we do this by walking down to the post office and depositing it in depositing the checks or making a request, you know, it's like old fashioned stuff that could have been automated years ago. And so, you know, we, we, we throw away a lot of money and it justifies the jobs of a lot of people who probably we don't need in the state workforce. And so I understand where the tax foundation is coming. I know your secret. I know why you're interested in this stuff. Because if the state is inefficient and throwing away money left and right, on things it could fix, like the computer system. All it has to do is you know, develop the political will to fix that system. All it has to do in all of this is to you know, have the leadership uh, and the political will uh, to become more efficient, like other states are in many ways. Then we would have less risk of the pressure that you see and I see for an increase in taxes. Ultimately, we're going to have to increase in taxes to cover these funded and unfunded liabilities. <laughs> And, and um, I know you're the method of your madness here. I know why you're interested in this fiscal responsibility issue. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just madness. <laughs> you're right about that part. <laughs> Am I right? Well, we, we, uh, you know, we, we try our darndest uh, to bring the, the issue in front of people, wh whether they, you know, uh, what, they, what they do with it once they see the information is kind of another thing. But, you know, we do what we can. Yeah. Well, what do you recommend? Tell me, tell the people, what do you recommend in terms of, a, if I make you governor, okay, what do you do? Well, we start, I think we have to start looking at those, uh, those four Ps and, you know, make them a priority and get them fixed. Uh, then I think we'll, we'll be a lot better off. I suppose what you're really saying is that the four Ps are governed by the fifth P. Which is? Priority. Well, of course, yes. <laughs> Tom Yamajika, president, that's a P also, of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. You're on a roll there, Jay. <laughs> We're both on a roll, Tom. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Aloha.